Let's give Jesus a big hand clap of praise, Lord. We thank you. We love you. We glorify you in this place. Hallelujah. Look at your neighbor before you sit down and say, I wish you looked this good every Sunday. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. You can sit down. It is. You guys look good today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope you spent more time in the Word this week than you did picking out your outfit. <laughs> Praise God. I know Justin already told you I wasn't on my best behavior today, and he is correct. I am not. I am not. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I'll just start off with it. You know, the thing is, uh, we gather every single Sunday. We have been gathering every single Sunday. And the lives of people. You know, last Sunday, not only in the morning were there just amazing things that happened, but last Sunday night, now... You get some people who are on the outside looking in. I deal with it on Facebook, but as you know, I'm a professional comment deleter, and and I'm quick at the draw, and you know, we over 70 miracles happened in here last Sunday night, and (laughs) people's eyesight came back. We saw people who had like spinal meningitis healed in the name of Jesus. We saw people who weren't able to walk, able to walk. Uh, you know, we saw a lot of people with, with uh, ringing in their ears for like, for like the last 10 years. God instantly touched their ears. You know, I mean, weeks before that, we saw God heal people of Parkinson's and diabetes. I'm just trying to tell you that he's still, he's not on the cross. He, he actually got up. Hallelujah. And, 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 and he provides healing and deliverance and sanctification in Jesus' mighty name. It's yours for the taking, but you got to be willing to take it in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I better settle down now. I better get started. We got to be on our best behavior for the one time year guest today. I'm just going to say it. Many people treat Easter like prostitution. They, they, they want pleasure without relationship. They want to... <laughs> I'm sure brunch today is going to be interesting. But they, they want to visit the cross... But they don't want to have a relationship with the one who was on the cross. And, you know, visiting the cross doesn't save you. A lot of people have visited the cross. A lot of people have done it over the last 2,000 years. And I've found it fairly simple to get people to the cross. The difficult thing is actually getting them on the cross. And I know you might be thinking, is there a scripture for that? Jesus took our place. Well, I'll get to you here in a minute. Because it's a Christian thing to say, I'm saved. I'm saved, and I know that I am. I'm saved, and I know that I am. I'm so glad that I know that I am. It was a song we used to sing. I'm saved. I'm saved. But then, here's what's interesting. The moment you start talking about the things that we were saved from, the room gets pretty intense. And I just want to make sure that you know you're not in a Mickey Mouse clubhouse today. That, that the church itself not only preaches the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, and the seating with Christ. See, that's the thing. That, that, that if we don't understand this. See, Jesus not just came and died for me. He saved me, but he saved me from stuff. See, we, we, see, 
Have you ever known anybody that says, I'm saved, but when you start talking about the things they were saved from, they were like, well, I don't find anything wrong with that. Then you're never saved from it. I was saved from pornography. I was, I was saved from homosexuality. I was saved from hatred and lying and gossip and wickedness. I was saved from myself. Jesus saved me from something. Amen? And so there's a difference between being saved and being sorry. I'm here again, second service. But, but... Has your kids ever gotten caught and they said, I'm sorry? Has anybody ever told you, I'm sorry? But they just turned around and did it again. See, when you're saved, you realize the destruction of what you said you were sorry for. You see that? You see that? And I know some of you, hey, it's Easter. Aren't Easter services supposed to be relaxed and reserved? Honey? Honey? There ain't nothing reserved or relaxed about the cross of Christ. There's nothing. And you want to know what's wrong with the church. There's a lot, but I can give you one. They're on their best behavior today. They've been on their best behavior for the last 20 years. And their kids have been turned over to the devil. This world has become a gutter. And we're still preaching a Mickey Mouse gospel. But Jesus came to give us power. Dudamus power. And once you understand this power, it'll change your facial expressions. It'll change how you act. It'll change how you walk. It'll change how you talk. It'll change how you treat people. It'll change the glow about you. You can't walk around with Christ in you and look like you ate a lemon. See, see. But, but, Pastor John, we, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't want to offend anybody today. Then we can't preach on the cross. Can't do it. Paul said we couldn't do it. Galatians 5.11 says, if I were no longer preaching salvation, now wait, wait, wait. Preaching salvation through, see a lot of people are preaching salvation through something else. But preaching salvation through the cross of Christ, no one would be offended. Why is there so much offense in the church? Why do people get offended? They killed Jesus. That's how much they hated his message. And if you think it would be any different today, the only difference today is they would have done it quicker. the scripture answers why some people churches never cause offense they aren't preaching salvation through the cross of Christ and you hear a lot about what America needs what does America need well I can tell you America doesn't need bigger bombs America obviously doesn't need more masks no there's enough masks in America I'm not against you wearing a mask. I'm just saying, quit taking my Starbucks straw away, acting like you're for the environment, when the pollution in the ocean right now with masks is unheard of. You see what I'm saying? And so we don't need more masks. We obviously don't need another vaccine. What America needs is some militant preachers who aren't afraid to proclaim the gospel. That's what America needs. America needs some people who will rise up in the authority of Christ and preach the gospel for what it is. Oh, yeah. Mark Alford called me. Mark Alford called me Friday morning. And he said, hey, we're doing this story right now on the decline of church membership and attendance. And I said, what are you talking about? I said, not at our church. He said, well, the story is because they're preaching against homosexuality. I said, well, wait, let me stop you there, Mark. Churches aren't preaching against homosexuality. 
Oh, no. They're marrying. They're endorsing all kinds of stuff. But I'll tell you, we, we preach against this. Others preach against it. We have no seating problem. Our problem is we need more seats. And, and so this world doesn't understand they're looking for the reason the church is in decline. And I can tell you why the reason the church is in decline. I've seen more pastors in the last week. Oh, they got real bold when a rapper came out with some Satan shoes. But they shut down their church a year ago. Bunch of cowards can't rise up in the authority of Christ. But they can speak against some tennis shoes. Yeah. You might as well just get in it this morning. See... If you don't leave the world, see, there's a tug, right? There's a tug. And as the gospel goes forth, you feel the world pulling you back this way. The gospel's pulling this way. The Bible says you're halted between two opinions and you're unstable because a man of two opinions is unstable in all his ways. So we sit and we want to we want to accept, but we want to be offended. We want to we want to come to Christ, but we want to walk with the world. If you walk with the world, you are an enemy of God. Now, see, many people come to church on Easter and they're not looking for the gospel. They're looking for Tony, not the tiger, the Baskin Robbins. They want something to make them feel like they're okay. But you know what? If you haven't been crucified with Christ, you're not okay. And the Lord dealt with me three days ago. And he said, John, you're going to have people come to your church that won't be back for another year. So why are you going to give them something soft? Wouldn't you say those people need to be given the unadulterated gospel more than anybody else? Well, absolutely. Because see... I'm going to stand before God one day and he's going to say, well, he's not going to say on 2021, there was some people in your building and I'm telling you, they needed to hear the gospel, but you didn't give them the gospel. You gave them a golf clap. You gave them something soft. And let me tell you, soft gospel makes soft people and soft people aren't saved people. God's looking for some soldiers. He's looking for some men and women who can who 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 say I'm not going to be controlled by the system of the world. You can put me back in the corner. You can put me in my little cubicle. You can act like you're going to fire me. You can do all that you want. You can intimidate me. You can ostracize me, but I'm not going to say I'm not going to stop saying what the kingdom says. They locked Bunyan up in a place where he couldn't even lay down for two weeks straight. And they were trying to get him to speak against the gospel. If you will let you out, he said, I'm fine in here. He said, for wherever I am, the kingdom is. God was with them in that box. And let me tell you, when God is with you, It doesn't matter if you're standing or sitting. I know some of you are saying, you know, I don't think I could do that. But let me tell you, his grace is sufficient in the time of need. You might not think you can do it now, but when you're there, your weakness, oh wait, his strength replaces it. It's a fight. It's the good fight of faith. You see, the cross has become a place of comfort not conviction. Think of that. It's become a place of justification, not liberation. People use the cross to justify their wickedness. Instead of pointing to the cross and saying, I died with Christ, they pointed to the cross and say, I'm all right still living in my old self because he died for my old self, but I want to keep my old self. Jesus didn't come to earth to give people a get out of hell free card. He didn't come to earth so you could justify your sin through grace. People that preach grace like that, my friends don't know the first thing about grace. 
You got people all over the country preaching about grace, and they're only preaching about grace because they want to remain in what they're in, and they makes it feel good. And grace will make you feel good when you understand what grace is. But the gospel is not about a feeling. It's about a liberation. It's about a fellowship, a connection, a restoration. He didn't come so I could say I'm better than other people. 1 Timothy 1.15 says why Jesus came. It says it very plainly. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. When was the last time someone said I was the chief of sinners? When was the last time someone actually admitted I'm lost and I'm dying? See, if you really want to know what Jesus will do, look at Paul before he encountered Jesus. It wasn't a, well, a gradual monthly. I'm telling you, instantaneously his life was changed. Instantaneously, the blinders dropped off his life. Instantaneously, he picked up his cross and he followed the Lord. Instantaneously, he said, I'm never going back. See, you'll go back if you don't understand what you were saved from. It's the whole reason Jesus came to earth. He gave his perfect life to pay the complete penalty for our sin, which is our personal offenses against God. He provided forgiveness and restored relationship with God to all who would accept his sacrifice for themselves and entrust their lives to him. Jesus said, In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Now, when did Jesus get a little irritated? He got irritated with people who thought they weren't lost. He got irritated with people who said they could see, but they were blind. You can't come to Christ without first admitting you are lost. I mean, why are you going to go home when you're not lost? Salvation can occur when you don't think there's anything you need to be saved from. And see, that's the thing. There is a work in progress But that doesn't condone what a lot of people are doing. See, we look at a work in progress a lot of different ways than the Bible actually preaches. I mean, there are people who come to Christ and they really don't think they're lost. And I'll give you the example of this. If they really thought they were lost, they wouldn't continue to justify the things that made them lost. We come to Christ, we accept Christ, but then we deny what he teaches. That is the American church. That is what the American church has become. And I could give great long examples as I normally would on a Sunday, but I'm handcuffed by time today. tell you something. This will this will really um, there's a church here in town that apologized to its community. And I quote, we are sorry for saying such hurtful things. This pastor said that his church will remain part of a denomination but will no longer treat 
certain lifestyles as second-class Christians. You don't need to treat them like second-class Christians because they're not a Christian. If I beat my wife every Monday and Thursday and I come to Christ and I keep beating my wife, are you going to say, hey, he's just working on it? You're not going to say that, are you? You're going to say, something's wrong with him. He must have not be a good taker. He must, I know he gave his life, but I, I, I don't know if he gave it. Because if I gave my life, then wait a minute, Christ lives in me. And if Christ lives in me, then he empowers me. You see what I'm saying? All the old stuff has passed away. Now before, now see, I'm just telling you, there are people who don't understand this. We don't want to be a place the pastor said, where children are hurt by the church or made to feel they are less than. Our current book of discipleship says that the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. We will be removing that. The pastor compared the traditionalist stance on homosexuality to the Bible's stance on slavery, which he doesn't know anything about slavery. In the Bible, because God over and over and over and over and over again condones slavery. I mean, condemns slavery. He over and over again says, no, nope, you can't treat people like that. And not only that, if you understand the word, the bond servant, it's like you going and you buying $5,000 at Best Buy and you don't have the money and you're like, hey, can I work it off? That's not slavery, that's paying your debt. And so there's things in the Bible that a lot of people don't understand. And what the devil does is he creeps in and gives people falsified information to justify their current information. All I'm trying to tell you, and I hope you understand me this morning, is don't look for the devil with horns and a tail. He doesn't come in that direction. He covers his tracks. He comes in in such an intangible way that it makes him look natural. And the church has to recognize what is actually happening, trying to preach this morning. But the enemy does not mind how many so-called churches there are, how many preachers there are, or how many religious worship services there are. Satan is against life. And in most churches, there is no sense of life, no registering of the testimony of the risen Lord and Savior against the evil forces that he's come to destroy. Much today that is called the church bears little resemblance to the Bible's view of the church. Satan only needs to fight that which is genuine. Did you hear me? We got to get back. We got to get back. Most churches could continue 95% of their activities if the Holy Spirit was removed from earth. I'm going to go back to my message. If I don't stand, if I don't proclaim If I let the love of acceptance override the truth, darkness will invade. If I'm not willing to be hated. You see how deceiving the devil is that you can preach something that is gushing at the seams with love, yet the devil will convince people who aren't saved that it's hate. Isn't that interesting? That saving people is actually the hateful thing to do. Letting them rot and decay and end in destruction is now the new love. How can someone come to the cross and still be alive to sin? Not saying we don't make mistakes. We all make mistakes. 
But that's the problem. We want to talk about the mistakes more than we do our risen Savior. And how can someone say they've accepted salvation through the cross but continue to defend the very things they were saved from? Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. See, Jesus died for us. And we talk about that. He took our place. He paid for our penalty. But Paul took it a step further and said, not only did Jesus die for me, but I died with him. He says, I have been crucified. Now, if you understand what crucified means, there's a suffering, an agonizing, a denying. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer John that lives, but Christ lives in me. <laughs> See, you didn't know old Johnny, but John's not up here today. Ah, old John died years ago. And the man that stands before you today has been crucified. He says, Christ lives in me and the life that which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Did you catch that? Paul said that I have been crucified with Christ. Many people are trying to be alive in Christ, but never died with Christ. A lot of people are trying to be raised to life, but they're not willing to be buried with Christ. How can you rise if you're not dead? I'm answering questions, not from you. But the Holy Spirit put questions in me and then gives me the answers so that you might understand. How? I mean, this is this is this is the the great question that many people ask. Have you ever wondered how some people can be so hateful and so vindictive? And so filled with malice and greed and jealousy. All the things that the Bible says should not be named among you. Isn't that interesting? The Bible says, wait a minute, there isn't like a a period for you to work these things out. Don't let them be named among you. If you can will to do something, you can will not to do something. If you can will to hate somebody, but wait, something changes. Because now it's not only willpower. It's Christ's power working in you. What you couldn't do and overcome before you came to Christ, you got a new power, a new life on the inside of you. But wait, people say, how can they stay the same after they've accepted Jesus? How can they be so hateful while carrying the label of a Christian? My friends, the reason they are the way they are is because that's all they're carrying is a label. They're not carrying a cross. And John, Jesus tells us in the book of Luke, if anyone desires, he says, it's your decision. I'm not making you come. You weren't drafted into this army. You volunteered to come in this army. And once you come in this army, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. He says, if anyone, if anyone desires to come after me. Notice the first thing he says that person should do. He doesn't say you need to say a prayer. He says, no, let him deny himself and take up his cross monthly. Weekly. No, 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 no. Daily and follow me. The choice between living for ourselves, which is denying Christ, 
and living for Christ, which is denying ourselves, must be made daily. Everybody wants a one-time experience that's going to fix all their problems. No, you got to renew your mind daily in this thing. You don't come to church yearly or monthly. You come weekly, but you live in the Word daily. Some people describe salvation, and after they're done explaining it, sounds really like nothing more than saying yes to a date. But just because you go on a date with somebody doesn't mean you're married to that somebody. People love dating because there's no commitment in dating, it's just fun. And then when you get tired of them, you go, see, that's the problem. The church got tired of what was true and started seeking what was mystical. Yeah. But if you understand the word, it's new every day. Salvation's more than a response. You know, when the Bible says, with your heart, you believe, with your mouth, you confess... It's talking about the way faith works. There's a lot of people who have acknowledged Jesus as their Savior, and they're not saved. I'm not trying to send you to Golden Corral after this, which if that's where you're going today, I shall pray over your stomachs in the name of Jesus. I never want to go to a place that sounds like the Old West where they shot people and got away with it. I don't know about that. Golden Corral. It's like cottage cheese. I don't know about cottage cheese. I don't want to eat cheese. That's I mean, I'm going to eat like like uh, you know apartment cheese, loft cheese. No, I don't want no cottage cheese. They say what goes in your body is what your body will look like, and I don't want cottage cheese. (laughs) See, I got to give you a little laugh so you can take a little more. See, this this bothers people. Salvation is more than a response. It's more than an acknowledgement. More than a a, a filling out of a card. Jesus replied. This is one of the most relevant scriptures today. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 3 through 9. Now listen. Why do you, by your traditions, oh, we love those. Jesus didn't like them so much. It's amazing. Anyway, got a lot I want to say on that. Violate the direct commandments of God. For instance, God says, honor your father and mother. And anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. That's what we're not in the Old Testament, by the way. How many of us would still be alive? In the kingdom, honor is a thing, and it's not a small thing. If you wonder why people don't honor you, well, they don't honor Christ. If they don't honor the king, why are they going to honor you? Now, wait a minute. Anyone who speaks disrespectfully of father or mother must be put to death. But you say, it's all right. See, there's a lot of people, Jesus is telling them, but you say. That's not what I said. But you say, it's all right for people to say to their parents, sorry, I can't help you, for I have vowed to give to God what I would have given to you. Of course the Pharisees are preaching this. They want the money. 
it's funny that greed's always established in religion. But religion's always the one preaching against greed. Religion's always the one preaching against prosperity, even though they have a 10,000 square foot house that they've sold from books. But they tell you, you don't need to seek the great things. Oh, we're against prosperity preachers, but you're living a prosperous life. You see, isn't that funny? You know, they made this documentary on Netflix. And everybody that, I wonder how much money they made on Netflix from the documentary. And the people in the documentary who were speaking against prosperity have prospered. If you look up their net worth, it, 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 it's more, it's, it's way more than those that are preaching that God wants to bless you. I'm just saying, know your facts. If I walk up to Quick Trip and someone says, hey, the Empire State's falling down. You think I'm going to believe them? I'm at Quick Trip. That guy must be stoned on a hot dog or something. I'm going to look it up myself. That's the thing. We get information from the news. We get information from our friends and we think to ourselves, oh my gosh, that happened. And then you go and tell 15 people. And then you find out it didn't happen. Now, how are you going to go back? Because you don't know who those 15 people told. Because gossip is a lot like a pillow that's filled with feathers. If you were to burst that pillow and shove it out your window, you wouldn't be able to find all the feathers. You wouldn't be able to put them back in the pillow. That's why the Bible says be slow to speak, be quick to hear. In this way, you say they don't need to honor their parents. And so, what do you do? You cancel the word of God for the sake of your own tradition. How many people, what I just read you a minute ago from a church here in town, they've canceled the word of God for the sake of their own tradition. They've canceled the word of God because they don't want to be not accepted. They want to be loved by a community that's going to hell, but they need to preach the gospel so that community can be a community in heaven with the church. (laughs) Pastor John, you seem... You seem kind of excited. Wouldn't you find it something wrong if someone was preaching life, but they seemed dead while they were teaching it to you? You'd have to wonder if that life ever got on the inside of them. But then we need to be more reserved because if we're more reserved, then we seem more intellectual. And if we're more intellectual, then we can say to ourselves, look at me, look at me, look at me. But Paul says, I'm not here to entice you with fancy words. I'm here to give you the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ for it's only in the gospel. I'm not ashamed of it. And it's the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes. You hypocrites. Jesus said that. I don't have any paintings of Jesus. I'm thankful we don't have any paintings of Jesus. Because people start worshiping those paintings. I'm glad we don't know what Jesus looks like. Really, we don't know what Jesus looks like. Because there'd be people that, as the word word of God says, people judge, judge on the outside. I wonder how much he would have been accepted. Because in Isaiah 53, it says there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. He was mangled beyond belief. The people that understand the Bible that are in the medical field say there's no way he should have made it to the cross. He should have died at the whipping post. Mom, in Isaiah 53, 2, it says, well, actually in 1, it says, who has believed our message? Meaning that not everyone's going to believe. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 16. To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. See, like a root in dry ground. Meaning this this, this world gave Jesus nothing. He gave it everything. We turned our backs on him and we looked the other way. He was despised. 
and we did not care. See, I found out that when someone's hurting you, most people don't care who's hurting you as long as no one's hurting them. You ever notice that? That's how people can befriend those that are cutting you because they're not cutting them. Yet it was our weakness he carried. Isn't it amazing that we're trying to get the benefits of something we didn't do? It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his trouble was a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on on him the sins of us all. And we wanted nothing to do with him. So the next next time someone hurts you, remember that you're not dying in front of those that are mocking you. And you're not forgiving those that have nailed you to the cross. Jesus is saying in this scripture, and I finish, because he says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people, they honor me with their lips. See, they acknowledge him. They respond to him, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. Jesus is saying there's a lot of people acting in my name. They honor me with their lips, but they don't belong to me. I'm just trying to clear up confusion. Because if you're not careful, the devil uses fake ID Christians to keep people to not come to Christ. For if that's what Christ is, I want nothing to do with it. I'm not saying there are, you know, people say, well, I'm not going to church. There's imperfect people. That's why people come to the church. Do you know anybody that goes to the gym after they're in shape? I'm only going to go to the gym when I'm in shape. That'd be stupid. You need to go into the gym because you're fat, not because you're in shape. You need to come to Christ because you're a sinner, not because you got it all figured out. See, just as you get offense at being fat or being called or the word fat, we get offended at being called the word sin. Isn't that interesting? That we'll miss the truth of what we actually are. That was for all you pastors who troll me during the week. And listen to my sermons. Oh, I know who you are. You get on there. But see, now it's tough for you. I preach so long and you don't have the discipline to listen to the word for more than 10 minutes. You're fast forwarding to find something that offends you. But let's be careful. You're not looking for something that's offending you. What you find is truth. You're not in the truth. And you want to justify the way that you talk, the way that you act. But you better stop it. Because we're coming up on the days of Ananias and Sapphira. You wait and see. You will start seeing live pastors start dropping dead as they're preaching and people will say it's a heart attack no we don't know what happened we know what happened just reminding you need to get your mind right quit deceiving God's people People are hungry for 
put your field on the world. I find it interesting that the people in the seats are more hungry than the people on the stage many times. But the last year has showed them your true color. That's why your service this year was down. Because you preached for so long about so many things, but showed the people we don't really believe that. We take our marching orders from the White House, not God's house. And I don't care who's in the White House. I follow no man. I follow no man. My loyalty is not to a man. My loyalty is to a Savior, to a King, and a Redeemer. Some of you, your plots have already been chosen. The hole's already been dug. And you're so far from God, you're so depraved, deprived, however your grammar wants to say it. They honor. They say, honor. They say they honor their mother and father. But their actions say mother and father has become a doormat. You see, instead of making excuses, Jesus wants us to nail our passions and desires to the cross because true salvation requires a crucified life. I, you know, like I said, people don't have a problem coming to the cross. They, they, there are a lot of people who have just stood at the cross for years, but they've never nailed their passions and desires to it. Galatians 5.24 tells us this. I'm giving you the word of God this morning. If you're, if you're upset, believe me, I'm not your problem. I can't save you. I owe this world nothing but the gospel. And that's what I'm going to give you today. And those who are Christ, whoa, that means if you belong to Christ, they've crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Well, I just want to do it. Well, there's a lot of things I want to do, but guess what? I don't do them. Well, I can't. Yes, you can. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Your pants don't unzip themselves. You make a decision. Your car doesn't drive itself. That needle doesn't stick itself. You make a decision. And you got to nail some stuff. It's passions and desires. See, we don't want preaching like this anymore. We just want to be told that old Danny is fine the way he is. But Danny's dirty and he needs a savior that will clean him up. That's what he needs. He don't need any more patter. He needs a cross. He needs a crucifixion. He needs a a resurrection and an ascension and a seating with God the Father. A lot of people here. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. What's changed? See, see, a lot of people made Jesus their Savior. They've never made him their Lord. There's a difference. Jesus is my co-pilot. That's the problem. You still want to fly. Jesus, take the wheel. He don't want the wheel, honey. He wants the whole car. He wants the whole thing. Think about the way we... Jesus, God is my co-pilot, meaning you're in the driver's seat. You can't fly friendly skies when you're flying. You need the captain. I ain't talking about Morgan. But let me tell you something. If you will, this morning, surrender it all to Christ. If you will, this morning, give everything to him, a great exchange will happen. Your your weakness will be exchanged for strength. 
Your sadness will be exchanged for dancing. Your worry will be exchanged for worship. See, I'm warming the stage up. Just warming it up. Warming it up. Warming it up for my dad. I figured the best thing to do after Easter is have my dad get up on this stage and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. I'm warming it up. Oh, hallelujah. So, if you got a problem with me, don't come back next week. I'm just the offspring. He's the fountain. So, Dad, can you do that? Where are you going next week? Mom's telling you you can. You better listen to her. You'll be here. Better check his schedule. That's right. Get him. Get him, Dad. Anytime. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Papa Burgundy is going to be here next Sunday. I need to, I need to. Sadness. Worries exchange for worship. See, what is the great exchange? Well, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 20 tells you. I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness, not pathetic, see, of God's power made available to you through faith. Woo! See, when Jesus told them, cast the nets, they couldn't see the fish. See, what God's wanting to give you, you can't see. He's just telling you to cast. All you need to do is cast. Woo! You want all the, I need a plan. No, just faith don't give you a plan. Mm Mm-mm. At least none of the ones I've gotten. If you've gotten one with yours, tell me about it. I need to talk to them. Then your lives, woo! See, does the church need a, People say, you didn't put much on Facebook for Easter. Well, you don't need to. Then your lives will be an advertisement of this immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in the heavenly realms. There are some people, you're in here right now, and there's a war going on the inside of you right now. There's a, there's a place right now you want to get up so bad, but you want to stay seated, and it's a struggle. It's a warfare between the spirit and the flesh. The devil wants to keep you. The devil doesn't want to give up any territory. He wants, he wants to keep you. He wants to get you back. This world wants you back. Those streets want you back. And you can go back. But there's a war. It's going on the inside of you. Many of you are sitting in here today, and you, I don't know what I feel. I don't want, it's, it's the Holy Ghost trying to bring you home to the Lord. And listen, that's what it is. The Bible says the Holy Spirit draws men to Christ. See, I'm not drawing people. What I'm preaching is, how will they be saved if they're never told? And how will they be told if there's not a preacher? This world has basically stepping on the mouth of preachers, but the Bible says salvation can't come if there aren't preachers who will rise up and preach the word of God. The moment, the moment you place your faith in Christ, the power that that's not from this world comes on the inside of you and it makes you an overcomer.
Oh, don't let the devil lie to you for another nanosecond. You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to remain defeated. You don't have to be keep being beat like a dog. You don't have to be controlled by people. You don't have to be controlled by this world. We are married to another. You can't even preach what I'm about to say in most churches. Toxic masculinity. But women walking around without shirts on isn't toxic. You ain't empowering nothing. The most joyous moment, biblically speaking, in the life of a bride ought to be the moment when she loses her name and independence at the marriage altar. She loses her name, I lose my right. We become one. See, it's a mirror. I'm no longer in control. See? See? You want to know why the church is broken? Because the marriages are broken. Because we, people think, well, it's no big deal. Anybody, see, when you, don't, when, you, when you don't stand up for the sanctity of marriage, well, how do you know they're not a girl? Do they have any kids? See, the thing is, my identity is found in Christ and Christ alone. But once I find my identity in him, everything else falls in line. I'm going to line this stage up this year. I am. With people who used to be homosexuals. I'm going to tell you, they're all over the place. And they found Christ. And I've been watching their testimonies online. And my God... You know what the homosexual community needs to hear? You know what the pornography community needs to hear? They need to hear people that say, I got out. And let me tell you, I've never been the same. I got out in Jesus' name. I got out in Jesus' name. Hey, 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 hey. See, 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 see. Taking her husband's name. She then is to lose her life in his. See, she is married to another. And in this union has a new source of life. I don't like that. Then you're not going to like what I'm about to say about our relationship in Christ. The reason people have a problem with Christ is the same reason they have a problem with their spouse. They don't want to be told what to do. And there are times I get off track and Lisa has to tell me what to do. Ain't no woman should tell you what to do. My friends, I'm thankful I got a Holy Ghost wife who can tell me something when I get off track. And she, she's glad she has a Holy Ghost man of God that tells her when she's getting off track. And if you got two Holy Ghost people in the house, let me tell you, there ain't going to be a lot of crooked paths. There's going to be just a straight road because you're going to pull each other back in in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. My Rolex watch says it's 1030. I'm just kidding. (laughs) I've been wanting to say that. (laughs) There's some people your heart dropped and came up at the same time. Oh, oh, okay. The most blissful moment of our lives ought to be when we, by the work of the cross, have renounced our own right to self-ownership and have reckoned ourselves dead indeed to sin and the world and gloriously and wonderfully alive in Christ. See, the cross is a place where sinners come to the Savior. 
The cross is the place where the lost find their way. The cross is the place where the spiritually blind receive their sight. The cross is the place where the corrupt find redemption. And see, because of the cross, you can come to God smelling like a bag of dope. But because of the resurrection, you can move on from that bag of dope. I hear a lot of people saying, well, you can come smelling away, but they forget to tell you, you can leave with a different smell. The cross paid for your sin, but the resurrection gave you power over that sin. See, 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 if you're going to be alive in Christ, you must move on from the cross. The cross is a symbol. You know what one of its symbols is? The absence of God's presence. Maybe that's why a lot of churches have a cross on their building. Yes, we need to come by the cross for salvation, but we don't need to remain there. Let's go on. Let's go on to Pentecost. Let's go on to the ascension. Let's go on to the throne. See, the cross is actually a place of defeat, whereas the resurrection is a place of triumph. And when you, woo, woo, wait a minute. Oh, I'm trying to hurry. When you preach the cross, you're preaching death. And if you don't go beyond that, you leave people in death. See, without the resurrection, the cross wouldn't have mattered. How dare you? How double dog dare you? How dare you? 1 Corinthians 15, 14 says, And if Christ had not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. It's saying that if it was just the cross and there was no empty tomb, my friends, you can pack your bags and go look for another savior because you don't got no power over the devil. You ain't got no power over sin, but you need that tomb to be empty in the name of Jesus. You see, Jesus not only died for me, he was raised for me. 2 Corinthians 5.15, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. See, you've died. You're not living for yourself. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Oh, we say, oh, Jesus died for you. You need to finish that sentence. He didn't just die for you. He raised for you. Because if he died for you and didn't raise for you, he died for nothing. But wait. He didn't just die for you. He, he wasn't just raised woo, for you. You are seated with him today. Oh, get this. Oh, if you don't get this, lunch is going to be bland today. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him. Where are you seated now? Not where you're sitting now. You're seated in the heavenly realms. Oh, by faith, we are united with Christ Jesus. Did you hear me? Why are we living in defeat when we are seated above it? See, believers are seated with Christ in heavenly places, far above powers and principalities of darkness, and no demon... Not one single demon can detour the believer who is seated with Christ far above the works of the enemy. See, what the devil wants you to do is he wants you to make your own chair. He wants you to just, the cross. But see, he wants you to just keep the cross because he don't want you going to the tomb. He don't want you finding it empty because that's where he was defeated. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. See, it's a, it's a, it's a cross. You died in Christ. 
we raise to life. The ascension is the rapture, which is about to happen. And now you're seated with the Father. See, it's a, it's a story. He's telling you, from the cross to the seat. From the cross to the seat, that's what every believer can expect. Die to yourself. Live in Christ. Be raptured to the Lord. Be seated in heavenly places. But right now, even now you're seated in those places. As Christians, we are, we are seated. Our, 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 our seating and reigning with Christ in heavenly places is a position of authority and honor and triumph, not failure and depression and defeat. You got to be more in love with your father than you are your friends and family on this earth. I love my friends and I love my family. But they didn't save me. Now wait, wait. We are seated in heavenly places and therefore we look down on Satan. Hmm. You think Satan's looking down on you, you should be looking down on him from a place of triumph, not fear or defeat. See, Jesus Christ today is offering you what you'll never find in any drug or drink or relationship or thing. And he offers it to you for free. And only a fool would refuse what Jesus is offering to you today. Only a fool would walk away from such a life. Jesus Christ offers you what you'll never find in anything else. Jesus Christ is not the good man. Jesus Christ is the God man. Oh, this is what I've come to realize, that Christ was man enough to be nursed at the breast of Mary, yet he was God enough to create the milk that he drank. He was man enough to die on the cross, but he was God enough to create the tree that became the cross. He he was man enough to stumble under the weight of going up that hill to Calvary, but he was God enough, my friends, to create that hill. Jesus Christ, he has come. He's not a good man. He's a God man, and he's come to make you whole and I I, I close and nothing nothing you can build nothing you build or buy or drive or shoot or snort or hook or deal or play it never replace that void in your heart As long as you are separated from the master, you can buy it and build it and drive it and shoot it and snort it and hook it and deal it and play it and you'll just be empty every time. And I'm calling you not to religion this morning. Religion's powerless to save you. I'm calling you into a relationship with the Savior. He's he's wanting to get you back. He's wanting to renew what was lost. He's wanting to give you back what got away. And if your spouse won't come this morning, come alone. If you can't get your kids to want Jesus, go for it yourself. If your mama won't come, come by yourself. For now is the moment of salvation and now is the moment when redemption is offered and now is the moment when the transformation occurs. And if you're in here today and your soul is thirsty and it's broken and bruised and bleeding, you can come to Jesus today. You can bring your problems to Jesus. Bring your crisis to Jesus. And no matter what you've done, how bad you feel, Jesus has ripped the veil. He's opened the door of access to God. And all that the first Adam gave away, the second Adam has restored. And you can come boldly today in the name of Jesus. You can confess your sins and have your unrighteousness washed away in the blood of Jesus. 